Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nathaniel Stinnett, the founder and executive director of the Environmental Voter Project. And this mini briefing is one we get asked about all the time at the Environmental Voter Project. So I'm really excited to be recording it. Uh, but it's pretty darn nerdy, like a lot of the stuff we do at EVP. Today, we're going to be discussing how the Environmental Voter Project individually targets environment first voters. Like all of our mini briefings, it'll be about eight to 10 minutes long. Please feel free to let us know any questions you have in the comments and please subscribe to our YouTube page so that you can get notified about other briefings like this. I'm going to share my screen here and here we go. So what we do with the Environmental Voter Project to target voters is we use what's called predictive modeling. And although the examples I'm going to provide to describe predictive modeling to you is based on what we do at the Environmental Voter Project, I do think it's important to note that this is the same way that modern sophisticated political campaigns, like presidential campaigns and Senate and gubernatorials and, and even some congressionals use to target their voters. So this isn't unique to us at the Environmental Voter Project. This is how modern politics identifies voters. In a nutshell, the way that we build a predictive model is as follows. First, we survey enormous numbers of people, tens of thousands of voters. But we can get away with doing that because we're only asking one question. In this instance, we're asking, what's your most important political priority? All right, let's say that we're in Pennsylvania and we survey 10,000 people and a thousand of them say, climate change is their number one priority, or clean air, or clean water, or, or environmental justice, or some objectively obvious environmental issue. Well, then what we can do is we can look at those thousand people and we can say, okay, these thousand people just told us that climate or the environment's their number one priority. What do we know about them? And here's where we work with data scientists and we start looking at the data that's in voter files on these people, the census data, other publicly available like consumer and behavioral data. We only use publicly available data, but there's a lot of it out there. And what these data scientists can then start doing is start discerning hidden patterns and correlations that help them say, okay, wow, you know, there are a lot of different types of people among these thousand Pennsylvanians who just told us that climate and the environment's their number one priority. And we think we can find a lot of other Pennsylvanians just like them. And there's probably a really high likelihood that those people also list climate and the environment as their top priority. So as we start digging through this data on these thousand people who told us that climate and the environment's their number one priority, we can start seeing some data points that have what's called a lot of predictive value or predictive power. And maybe we see that forestry employees end up being like 11 times more likely than the average Pennsylvanian to list climate as their top priority. Or maybe people with new homes but no kids are six times as likely as the average Pennsylvanian to list climate as a top priority. Maybe basketball fans are more likely than baseball, hockey, or football fans to list climate as their top priority. And, and obviously, some of these data points are a little weird. And it's really important to note that no single data point is ever predictive on its own. It's never as simple as saying, OK, well, let's just target all forestry employees. No. But when you start clustering them together, then you can start to get a really high level of certainty that people who have these, these particular data profiles are probably going to be really, really likely to list climate and the environment as their top priority. Like maybe if you are a Latina grandmother living within 10 miles of Philadelphia who bought an electric vehicle in the last two years and subscribes to National Geographic, well, like, maybe we find that you've got a 91% likelihood of listing climate as your top priority. Or maybe if you are a, 
a black man in your 20s living in Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is, and you subscribe to the following three magazines and uh, you shop at one of the following two stores, you have a greater than 85% likelihood of listing climate as your top priority. And there are lots of little clusters like this. And again, to be clear, we're obviously not talking to every Pennsylvanian, but what we're doing is we're taking this initial data set, the 10,000 people we polled, isolating the ones who care so deeply about climate that it's their top priority, finding out all that we know about them, and then trying to find other clusters of people like those folks. And it's a long, long iterative process with lots of testing and refining. But at the end of it, what we're able to do is assign a score from zero to 100 to every single individual in a state voter file. And what you're seeing here is a distribution chart of every single voter in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And depending on your score, let's say you have a 40, that means you have a 40% likelihood of not just caring about climate and the environment, but literally listing it as your number one priority over all other issues. So it's important to know that this is a probabilistic score. This is a likelihood score. It doesn't mean that people with 80s care twice as much about climate as people with a 40. No, it means that people who have the score of 80 have an 80% 80 likelihood of listing climate as their number one priority. And as you can see in Pennsylvania, it's probably no surprise, there are millions of people who have like less than a 30% likelihood of listing climate as their top priority. No surprise there. And then there are a whole lot of people kind of in this mushy middle, they could go one way or the other. But then there are also a whole bunch of people, I mean, millions, who have a greater than even an 85% likelihood of not just caring about climate and the environment, but literally listing it as their number one priority over all other issues. These are people who, like, you shake them awake at night and they're going to scream climate change. These are the people who we care most about at the Environmental Voter Project. Because once we can isolate these people who have a greater than 85% likelihood of listing climate and the environment as a top priority, well, then we can go look at their voting histories in the voter file. And to be clear, we don't need fancy data scientists for this second part because whether you vote or not is public record. And so what we can then do is we can say, okay, here's a whole bunch of people. And obviously we haven't spoken to every single individual in Pennsylvania, but what we do know about these people on the right end of the spectrum here is that they've got an 85% or higher likelihood of listing climate as their top priority. Let's weed out the ones who are good voters and only talk to the ones who we know from their previous voting histories are unlikely to vote. And obviously, whether you're unlikely to vote in a particular election depends on the election, right? We will be targeting a much smaller group of people for a presidential election than we would for like a Philadelphia city council race, because there are lots of super environmentalists who are unlikely to vote in a city council race. There are far fewer who are unlikely to vote in a presidential. But to be clear about what this individualized targeting allows us to do then is we can then know, I mean, not to be creepy about it, but like by name and street address, who all of the non-voting super environmentalists are. And as an example, you're looking at a map of the 42,067 registered voters in Philadelphia who have a greater than 85% likelihood of listing climate or other environmental issues as their top priority, yet they have never voted before. They're registered to vote, but they haven't voted before. And not to put too fine a point on it, but we literally know these people by name and street address. We often have their telephone numbers. And what this then allows us to do is canvas and call and mail and send digital ads to these people with behavioral science-informed messaging designed to do just one thing, and that is turn them into better voters. And again, to be clear, 
have we individually spoken with every single one of these people and confirmed and gotten them to sign in blood that climate's their number one priority? No, these are probabilistic scores. But these are people with really, really high probabilistic scores telling us that, man, it is so darn likely that these people list climate as a top priority that we think it's a good bet to go after them and not worry about changing their minds or not worry about educating them about climate and the environment. And instead, just worry about turning them from non-voters into new voters and then new voters into consistent voters. So this is how we individually target low propensity environmental voters at the Environmental Voter Project. If getting mini briefings like this and getting other briefings like this about mobilizing environmental voters and some of the modern techniques that political campaigns use, if this is of interest to you, please comment, let us know how much you liked this, ask any questions, and perhaps most importantly, subscribe to our YouTube page so you can get a notification whenever we come out with new briefings like this. Thank you so much for being part of our work at the Environmental Voter Project, and I hope to see you at the next briefing.